Bueno, gracias por invitarme, Susana. Ha sido un, un gran placer y he disfrutado mucho de la sesión anterior <coughs> y espero eh, que ustedes disfruten de esta. Uh, now, I wanted to say a couple of things about the talk that we just had, the talk that we just had. Uh, and that is, there, there was one question about, um, both talks seem to me had a very, what I would like to call a sociological uh, analysis of the philosophical profession. It was not, they were not primarily philosophical talks, they were sociological ones, although there was a philosophical component in them and an important one, but I like to keep those separate. And I, I think that uh, the issue, one issue, the, the situation of the Middle Ages was brought up to <coughs> show that in the Middle Ages there were people from all over the place that actually uh, talked, uh, did philosophy in the same language. And I actually refer in my, in my talk to that. And what I like to pinpoint is that in the Middle Ages, there were centers of power, philosophical power. Not everywhere was or had the same power or the same uh, authority and so forth. And so there was what? Which was the place that was paramount? That was Paris. If you wanted to be somebody, you taught at Paris. You even visited there once in a while, just like Oxford and, you know. Harvard. <laughs> so, so you really had to come there and lecture there in order for you to be sort of anointed. anointed. Um, <clears throat> and there was also another point that was that, so there were people, all the people throughout Europe were, were uh, talking and doing philosophy in Latin. But the people that were heard were the people that were at Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, Cologne. Basically, those were the people that were heard. The people that were in Naples, no one has heard of them. Now, there was one guy who was from Naples that is very important, actually, Thomas Aquinas. But he was in Paris, not in Naples. Okay, so. Uh, in order to be heard, you have to be in the right place. But how do you get to be in the right place? It's the same thing. I mean, this is all my sociology of this, which can be completely wrong. You get to be in the right place if you had the, the, the right father. <laughs> you have to have studied, or mother nowadays, but it used to be just a father. You have to have the right teacher, because philosophy, like most other professions, uh, in fields is a very lineage, a very genetic uh, in, uh, sort of uh, discipline. And in fact, in other fields too, what is the constant, the most important factor that will uh, explain why you actually got a Nobel Prize in a particular discipline? Well, if your teacher got a Nobel Prize, you are very, uh, there might be you know, the possibility that you will get it. So there, is, there are these uh, factors. And so uh, to make the, uh, to, to, to change the system as it were, or as it were the, the, the context, and make Latin American philosophers to actually uh, enjoy that kind of prestige, they have to go to the centers of power of analytic philosophy, and they have to study with the people that are important there, and then they will have a chance. Otherwise, it's very difficult. Now, let me mention another thing. How, how could we change the Spanish, making the Spanish language a language of uh, philosophy that would be respected? Well, there are many suggestions that uh, you know, some of you made and that I read everywhere. But one of the things that I think is essential is that the people that do philosophy in Spanish really do philosophy in, in the sense that they, they find a problem that it's really interesting to them. Not because someone else is doing it, 
but because it's interesting to them. And then they develop it. And that there be a community in Latin America and places where Spanish is spoken where this is actually developed. All right. And if you have that, there might be someone outside that will actually pay attention to you. But if you don't have anything new to say, except a little wrinkle, a footnote, to someone else's work elsewhere, that's not going to get you very far. So I think that that's, that's what I have to say about that. But anyway, my talk is not about that at all. <laughs> but I thought that I would put that in. Now, uh, All right, this is a Spanish, and then I have an English text here. And what we are talking about is the semantic equivalence of uh, and the language of philosophical analysis. That's my, that's my talk. And <clears throat> uh, the thesis of the, of the talk is that the semantic equivalence between texts of analytic philosophy in different languages is difficult if not impossible in some cases to achieve, and therefore it is a mistake to restrict doing <coughs> analytic philosophy to English, as Gustavo Rodriguez Pereira does. And uh, uh, so that's going to be my thesis. Now, how am I going to approach it? Well, I'm going to approach it by just pointing out that I consider myself to have learned to do philosophy uh, actually when I tried to translate, well, in fact, I did translate and produce a translation of Suarez's <laughs> disputation on uh, the disputation five, metaphysical disputation five, which deals with individual unity and its principle, and uh, from Latin into English. I did that in the 1970s. Now, before then, I had go to the University of Chicago. I had, I had taken many courses in medieval philosophy and so forth in Toronto. I graduated and so on. But it was in the 70s when I was already a, a, a professor, <clears throat> an assistant professor at Buffalo, that I tried to do that translation or began that translation. And that is what really, I, th I, I think, taught me to actually do philosophy. And you say, well, what? What are you talking about, Suarez? Who knows Suarez today? <coughs> and who cares about him? How many philosophers <laughs> of the Department of Philosophy of any major university will even have heard of him? And so on. So the point is, why was it that it did it for me? And I hope that what I point out here helps. But let me say at the beginning that what helped me a great deal was that it was extremely difficult to do it. It was extremely difficult because I had had a great deal of training in Latin and so forth. And of course, by that time, my, my English was pretty good. So I understood what was happening. But I was not satisfied with what I was, that what I was writing in English was actually what Suarez would have said had he known, known English and what the text said. So the difficulties were enormous. There were things, for example, in Latin, in the Latin text, that are typical of what they did at that time, that time in the 16th century. They had such a, a training and community of people who were uh, well versed in what they were doing that they never finished an argument. They would say premise such and such and premise such and such and therefore, and they just put down therefore and then you were going to fill in. Now, you would think that it would be very easy to fill in that conclusion, it was extraordinarily difficult. Very, very difficult. And even when I filled them in, I actually wasn't sure that that's what, they, that what Suarez would have written. Even though the logic was right or whatever, it, there, were, there were things that just were very difficult. So trying to figure that out was an extraordinary exercise. And what's, what was what helped me. Now let me uh, ask the question, what is the basic translation assumption, uh, el presupuesto de la, tra de la traducción, uh, that all translators work with explicitly or implicitly, implicitly? And in English is what I call the principle of the semantic equivalence of text in different languages. A strong version of the principle is what I have here, which says any text in any language has semantically equivalent text in every other language. 
So that means that semantically, you have a text in one language, and every other possible language will have something that would, would be a, a semantically equivalent to it. And um, I mean, in, in fact, or a, a possibility. Now, most, I think Diana said something to the effect that, yeah, you believe that. And of course, I, as a translator, also believe that that's possible. <laughs> okay? Now, that's the key. It's possible, but to get it, it's very difficult. And one of the difficulties is what's going to come up in a minute. Now, so, what we have, let me go down. How do, how do we go down here? Let's see, here or where? Okay, <laughs> that, that way. Okay, so there are different types of texts, and this is important to recognize, because not every kind of text would have the same uh, the same likely, uh, the, the, th the same possibility of being translated uh, equivalently. And so we have, I put down here two texts, H2O boils at 100 <laughs> degrees centigrade and H2O hierve at 100 grados centigrados, and these are scientific texts. So what does it mean to say that one is equivalent to two? And here's where I bring up the point that I made during the, uh, uh, Diana's discussion. Namely, it could mean something like one and two express the same proposition. Okay. And that's a, what you might call a metaphysical criterion. There is a proposition where, I don't know, but that proposition is equivalent, I mean, that proposition is meant by either one or two, exactly like that. But there is another one which says that one causes the same understanding, okay, Comprensión, according to you, Diana, uh, in an audience A that two causes in an audience B. And this is a, an epistemic criterion, but it has to do with what people have in their heads in reaction to this text rather than in some, sem in some proposition that is somewhere in, the, uh, in <coughs> some part of the universe. Now, uh, so... What are the conditions of semantic equivalence in scientific texts? And my point here is that it looks like it is a community of users of the languages in which the two sentences, one and two, are expressed. So unless you have a community, and I'm going to refer to several other conditions in a minute, unless you have that community, uh, you are not going to have to be able to say that these texts are equivalent in semantically. So uh, now, if you take that as it is, and you say, OK, there is a community of uh, users or usuarios, then you say, well, fine. It looks like it's possible for H2O boils at, at two, or 1 and 2 to be semantically equivalent. And we might say, OK, scientific texts generally work in that fashion. But what about if what you have is a literary text? Oops, too much. And I give here another power source. OK, that means that I need to hold on. It's running out of use. <coughs> Okay, so these are all, all the, the text that the literary text that I used as an example is the first one, which is a very famous line from one of the poems by Emily Dickinson, which says, hope is the thing with feathers. And then what I, give, what I give in each of these are actually possible translations of this text. Okay. And the first one is the literal translation. La esperanza es la cosa con plumas. Now, when you say in English, hope is the thing with feathers, 
you have something, you, you understand something which is different from la esperanza es la cosa con plumas. Because uh, if someone said something like that, la esperanza es la cosa con plumas, in Spanish, it would be ridiculous. It would be <laughs> absurd. It's stupid. It's, you know, why? I, I cannot tell you why that text does not translate the first one, hope is the thing with feathers. And when you say hope is the, th the thing with feathers, something happens. You, you know, you somehow understand something that you had not understood. And that's the greatness of the, the verse and, of course, of Emily Dickinson. Now, you can try other things then. Okay, if not like the number two, let's try number three. La esperanza es la cosa que tiene plumas. Okay, that, the translation of that is hope is the thing that has feathers. That certainly is not equivalent to hope is the thing with feathers. How about number four? La esperanza es la cosa emplumada. Hope is the feathered thing. Well, that certainly is not equivalent to the one. How about number five? La esperanza es una cosa de pluma. Hope is the thing with feathers. Well, that again, it's not the same. A thing with feathers is not the thing with feathers. So what about the sixth one? La esperanza es algo de plumas. Hope is something made up of feathers. Actually, number six has more of a sense of what hope is the thing with feathers than all the others in my view, but that's my intuition. But the fact is that when you translate it into English, it comes out like something entirely different than the original. So it cannot be the same. What's wrong with three? I mean, I... With three, la esperanza es la cosa que... Why is it different from one? Huh? The sum is, 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 is with, okay? Hope is the thing with feathers. So it would be a thing that has feathers on it. And la esperanza es la cosa que tiene plumas. That means it's a thing that has, has feathers, okay? But it's not a thing with feathers. So with feathers... might be like just next to it. <laughs> exactly, there are possibilities like that that you can explore. All right, so... <laughs> Esa es otra posibilidad. La esperanza es esa cosa con plumas. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, but she, she, she's Spanish and therefore she knows the language <laughs> better than Cubans do. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, but every time that you try something, there is something that is missing. Now, if you look back at the points that I made, namely, what does it mean to be semantically equivalent? If you're talking about the meaning, the meaning, like that, you might say that, well, perhaps uh, number one and number two actually mean the same thing, okay? Strictly speaking, perhaps. But do they cause the same understanding in the audience? And that, I would say, doesn't look right. That's why we try other things. That's why it's so difficult to translate poetry or translate literature, because you, ha you have to create an instrument that actu actually will produce in the head of that person that is your audience uh, the same kind of phenomenon that happened in the head of the person that actually wrote that, or his contemporaries or her contemporaries, whatever it is. So this is, this is the problem <clears throat> that you have. So now, so the literary text seems to be a real problem. Now, let's go to Perez, uh, I mean, uh, to Rodriguez Pereira's thesis. Why is it that I'm talking about translations? This is the point. Well, Rodríguez Pereira's thesis is that la investigación en filosofía analítica concebida ampliamente debe ser publicada exclusivamente en inglés. Okay? And I assume that debe and, and puede are, are here. The, the distinction is not relevant. So we're going to use that, that if you say debe, that implies puede. All right. Now, there is a... An, an, okay. The point of Rodríguez Pereira, the relation of what he claims to translation is that if you are going to have, okay, in order for us to say that you can do uh, analytic philosophy in English, okay, 
you have to accept the fact that what you have in Spanish, what you have in English, says exactly the same as what you would have in Spanish and vice versa. That you, could not, that you would have to have semantically equivalent translations of one language into the other. Because otherwise, you could have in Spanish something that you could not say in English. Or you could have something in English that you could not say in Spanish, equivalently. All right? So that's why translation is very important for this thesis that he holds. However, the objection, la tesis de Rodríguez Pereira se apoya en el principio de equivalencia semántica, y el principio es falso, <coughs> basado en los textos litera el texto literario que vimos. Bueno, that uh, it's not effective for the simple reason that Rodríguez Pereira is not talking about all kinds of languages or all kinds of uh, language <coughs> games, but he's talking only about a particular view, namely he refers to uh, investigation in philosophical analysis. So, la tesis de Rodríguez Pereira requires only one version less strong than the principle of uh, semantic uh, equivalence. And that is that cualquier texto resultado de la investigación filosófica analítica en cualquier lenguaje <laughs> tiene un texto equivalente sem semánticamente en inglés y viceversa. Now, in order for this to work, however, you have to realize that there have to be conditions of equivalence. We talked about the conditions of equivalence a little bit earlier. And now what I'd like to do is talk about that in a, another uh, context, another strategy. Because the strategy, this, this first strategy or objection fails because of he has narrowed down the linguistic range that he has in mind. So now we have to go with something that will actually uh, make his thesis fail even though we accept the narrow parameters of uh, the thesis. So one is uh, la tesis de Rodríguez Pereira necesita la existencia de una comunidad filosófica analítica de usuarios que satisfacen ciertas condiciones y tal comunidad no existe hoy. The, this was a point that was discussed in one of the, some of the papers that you, that you, were, that you presented. And uh, the, the point is that in order for the thesis to work, you need to have that community of people that will understand the language and how it is used. Uh, and without that community, it doesn't work. Now, is that the only thing that we need? No, we need that community. But that has to be uh, translated or analyzed into a set of conditions, which I put down here. I just put some, not all of the ones that are necessary. That the community has to be train in a common curriculum. They have to know the particular language by being trained in a common curriculum. They, 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 that community has to have methodological uh, presuppositions that are also common. The language of education and of uh, research must be common. The genres used in which that uh, educate that uh, the uh, <coughs> research is <coughs> expressed must be also common, and there has to be a philosophical tradition based on common philosophical text. Now, the prime example of something like this, which was raised before, and which I'm going to refer to here is the Middle Ages. People will say, OK, the Middle Ages seems to have satisfied all of these conditions, conditions which are not satisfied by the analytic philosophy, philosophical community today. 
in the Middle Ages, you had a very strict curriculum. You, very, you had a methodological principles that they all accepted. They went to school, learned logic, and so <laughs> forth, and they proceeded accordingly. They had a language, which, which you, the common language for everybody <clears throat> in science and certainly in philosophy, and they have common uh, writing genres, namely the article form and the commentary, two, two of the major uh, genres. And then they had a tradition of a set of texts that for them were the text on which everything was based. And what were these texts? Well, you can go on back to Boethius, and Boethius actually translated some texts from the ancient world into Latin, from Greek, and these texts became sort of basic canonical text, which provided the terminology, the structure, and various <coughs> other conceptual structure, and so forth, of this uh, of this uh, tradition. Okay, now did the medieval did medieval philosophy actually uh, succeeded? I mean, it certainly succeeded in having a community of users of Latin of a language that was common to all peoples in the, Middle, in the Middle Ages, no matter whether they came from Italy, from France, from England, or from Germany. But there was a price to pay. And the price to pay <coughs> was that there were narrow parameters within which uh, medieval philosophers worked. Their work, because they were, uh, had all these conditions that were essential for their uh, devel development, actually that created for them, uh, it was like a cage which determined the subjects that they would, would study the ways that they would study those subjects, and so on and so forth. So for example, it was difficult for them, because of that structure, to consider empirical evidence. Okay. So there was, philosophy was based on largely speculative models. So if the, uh, the analytic philosophy community today were really a community, and had all these, satisfied all these criteria, or those, these conditions, they might have results of a, of a similar sort. And that is not very good. <coughs> now what about the second objection? So the first objection is that there is no such community, and if there were such a community, there would be these handicaps, okay? The second objection is Es un error mantener que el lenguaje de la filosofía analítica debe ser como el lenguaje de la ciencia y no como el lenguaje literario u ordinario. Okay. And one way of sidetracking uh, the, the, the problems <coughs> that having this uh, community of, of uh, linguistic community that is sort of closed in that way is to say that uh, the language that is used by uh, analytic philosophers, just like in the Middle Ages uh, Latin philosophy, was that they uh, somehow had a very peculiar technical language, which was separate from the literary language and the ordinary language. And the point that I want to make here is several points concerning whether analytic philosophy has that kind of linguistic unity, apart from the fact that, in fact, it does not have those conditions that were typical in the Middle Ages. There's too much variety <coughs> in analytic philosophy today to accept that to be the case. But here are some things to consider. First of all, Analytic philosophy, from its very beginning, favored the ordinary language. I mean, if you go back to people like G. Moore, what was his big deal? Precisely ordinary language. 
What about uh, even philosophers, I mean, the la philosophical language, analytic philosophical uh, community in the 50s, uh, ordinary language was a whole entire, uh, perhaps the most important part of analytic philosophy. So clearly there is a, analytic philosophy has had a penchant for ordinary language, and sometimes even literary language, metaphors of certain kinds are used and so forth. And therefore we have, we go back to the situation where the difficulty of translating that kind of language becomes very difficult. <coughs> so great. Okay, second, except, excepto por algunos lógicos, los filósofos analíticos usan ordinary language today. Now, if you look at the language that actually Rodriguez Pereira and all the people that responded to him are using in their articles, most of it is ordinary language. It's not technical language. How many philosophers used only what you might call very technical language? Well, philosophers of science, up to a certain extent, logicians perhaps, but the idea of having a language, a purely technical language, in which all that you're saying is expressed. That was the, the model that the Vienna Circle was searching. That doesn't seem to, to be the case even today among people who favor uh, technical language. Now number three, the peculiarities of particular languages have given rise to many important <laughs> philosophical positions. I mean, think, for example, about Aristotle and the distinction between substance and attribute or substance and property. Where does that come from? It comes from Greek. You look at Greek and you see that that is the structure of it. Why is it that the Greeks had this great uh, discussion of being and all these uh, this language of being and so forth, because their language allowed that. But if you go to China and you try to translate Aristotle, you really have a problem because they don't have the same terminology and so forth. So these are points that were brought up by other uh, speakers. And so it's one of the points that I want to uh, mention here. Number four, the very strict relation between ordinary language and culture is significant. And that's another matter, whether in fact uh, you can divorce ordinary language from a particular culture, and how are you going to translate these cultural products, linguistic products. And finally, the language ordinary, uh, el lenguaje ordinario está estrechamente relacionado a la experiencia, y la experiencia es fundamental para la filosofía. Our ordinary language is where we find our intuitions about the world and so on. <coughs> and that's important and therefore cannot be rejected. So to do philosophy technically, in a technical language, leaves out too much. And I think this is something that several of the critics of uh, uh, Rodriguez Pereira have pointed out. So let me just draw some conclusions here. And this will be in English. Now, it should be clear to you why I started this talk with a reference to my project of translating Suarez's situation five. A translator, as Boethius so well put it, is always a traitor, for a translation always fails to some extent, even when the translator is translating a rather technical philosophical text. Rufino, one of Rodriguez Pereira's critics, is simply wrong when he states that knowledge of Greek and Latin is certainly not a sine qua non condition for reading ancient Greek or medieval philosophy, since there are usually good translations available, end of quote. True, one may be able to read the translated text, but as to understanding the original author's meaning, that is another matter altogether. My experience is just the contrary to, what, to that of Rufino, for there is not a single translation of a philosophical text from one language I know into another that I also know that satisfies me or that is universally regarded by experts as a completely faithful translation of the original. Indeed, it is precisely because of this that the process of translation 
opens windows to previously unknown vistas. And the reason I was able to learn much by translating Suarez's text into English. Now you know why. And then, let me finish by saying this. Hmm. What Rodriguez, Rodriguez Pereira says leads me to infer, infer that he's not very fond of diversity, but scientists tell us that diversity is the key to life. Nature teaches quite clearly that a genetically diverse pool is the key to survival and flourishing. Sorry for the typos. Consider, consider how the very makeup of our species seeks variety. Nature wants diversity in order to facilitate our endurance. And such variety is also beneficial in the language of philosophy, as the history of philosophy indicates. And it should also be particularly beneficial when it comes to analytic philosophy. The principle of semantic equivalence is not pertinent, not because it is impossible to find such textual equivalence, as Benjamin Lee Worf thought, but because it is very difficult to do so, in part because the language of philosophy, including that of analytic philosophy, is mixed with ordinary and even literary language insofar as it relies on ordinary experience. So no, let us not restrict doing analytic philosophy to English unless we want to fall into a dogmatic slumber. Other languages should help us broaden our horizons and thus be instrumental in our quest, uh, quest for greater philosophical understanding. Thanks. So I think that's... Thank you. the importance of diversity for the genetic pool and the endurance of life and for the flourishing of analytical philosophy and why that's a good signal? Yeah, well, there is an experiment that is very interesting in, in uh, concerning uh, <coughs> smells and uh, what, what nature has to how nature has actually uh, promotes smells. This, this refers to attraction between males and females. Okay, females, apparently they have figured, are not attracted to the regular smells that males have. So, so you're talking about kind of life in general? Or? No, <laughs> female, human, human, right. human females. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're talking about <laughs> human, fe human females somehow do not, you know, they, they, what they did the experiment, they do it blindly and so forth. So they, are not, they don't know what they are smelling and so on and so forth. They usually normally, reject the smell associated with males, okay? And there is an exception, namely when they are ovulating. When they are ovulating, they like the smell of males. And, but this is more interesting than that, and that is when you have several males, the ones that are genetically more distant from them are more appealing to them. They like the smell of those males more than the smell of other males. And so, obviously, there's a sign here, namely, choose this partner who is very genetically different from you. Now, it seems to me that in, uh, so the argument can be made, this is an analogy between, between the, the world of, of uh, uh, you know, smells and, and nature and so forth. But you can do the, and the you can do the, uh, a, um, let's say, you can, you can refer to the history of philosophy and say, when is it that we have had the greatest productivity in philosophical development? Well, if you think about it, for example, it was in the Middle Ages, it was the, the 13th century. And what happened in the 13th century? That there were all these books from that they didn't know by Aristotle and so on and so forth that were translated into <coughs> Latin and they had them for, first, for the first time. So this infusion of diversity, of other things that they didn't know, actually created a boom in the field. 
And if you actually think about that, I mean, think about Wittgenstein's impact in British philosophy. And you can go throughout the history of philosophy and say this is a period or so that offers a particular <coughs> development, a flourishing of, of philosophy and ideas and so forth. It's usually connected with some kind of infusion from the outside. So that's the historical. And you can do the argument in many, many ways. So diversity, diversity is a source of richness and flourishing. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Laura says. Um, okay. Oh, yes, I'm presenting. I yeah, later I will I will pose my questions to okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so do you all have the handout? Yes. One side um, of the page is in Spanish and the other one is in Spanish. Before I begin, I, um, I want to thank Susana and, and you for being here, of course. And I feel very fortunate of, of being part of this workshop. And um, the, the title of my comments are, um, the, the title of my comments is <laughs> A Case of Simultaneous Translation into Spanish. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, the introduction and the, conclu the conclusions, I'm, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to speak in, in Spanish and the body of the comments I'm going to speak in, in English. Um, Mi propósito eh, el día de hoy es eh, abordar el problema sobre hacer traducción simultánea de conferencias en filosofía. Creo que este tema es un tema eh, relacionado a la discusión que nos trae ahora, que es eh, si eh, la afirmación del debate, si se debe de publicar eh, filosofía analítica eh, exclusivamente en español. Y creo que es un tema relacionado porque eh, eh, cuando, cuando, cuando eh, estamos en una conferencia o impartimos una ponencia, eh, estamos, estamos presentando de manera verbal nuestras, nuestra investigación este, y entonces por eso creo que es un tema relacionado. Eh, y eh, para, para llevar a cabo este objetivo, lo que voy a hacer es examinar dos aspectos de un proyecto de filosofía eh, que es un proyecto de filosofía mexicano eh, y el interés principal son temas en filosofía de la percepción y filosofía de la mente. Y eh, el primer aspecto es que eh, nosotros lo que hacemos es eh, entre las actividades que realizamos es invitar a profesores, filósofos de México y de otros países a impartir charlas al proyecto. Eh, y si el invitado no es un hablante del español, lo que hacemos es traducir eh, las charlas eh, al, al, al español. Este, por ejemplo, eh, si el invitado es, es, es un, no, no habla, eh, habla inglés, entonces hacemos la traducción al español, del inglés al español. Y eh, el otro aspecto en el que voy a enfocarme eh, tiene que ver con, con el grupo de gente que forma parte de este proyecto, eh, y es que casi ninguno de, de nosotros, me refiero a, no solo a los estudiantes, sino también al profesorado, eh, no nos juzgamos como hablantes competentes eh, del inglés. Y bueno, na, ahora, ahora voy a hablar en, en inglés. Um, quizá, quizá, sh should I say this, uh, the introduction in English? Yeah, probably, isn't it? Or, no, okay. So, um, I'm going to start saying um, uh, something about the project. Uh, so, Juan Cuajimalpa, a uh, public university in Mexico City, hosts um, a three-year research project in philosophy of perception and mind. And um, our group is made up of undergraduate, graduate students and professors interested in the areas of philosophy of mind and perception. And uh, we organized three types of events. 
So we have um, seminars, we have two um, types of seminars. We have a research seminar and also a translating, a translating seminar. We're currently translating uh, Susanna Siegel's uh, The Contents of Visual Experiences and also um, Gareth Evans' The Varieties of Reference. And in this seminar, we, we discuss um, these translations. And uh, we also have talks, uh, and <coughs> that includes um, lectures and seri uh, talk series and advice sessions. Um, so my, uh, my, my case of study is the following. Last February, uh, Professor Christopher Peacock of Columbia University visited WAMC to give a lecture. Uh, Christopher's uh, lecture dealt with uh, it was <coughs> philosophy of magnitudes, temporal properties, and philosophy of music. Uh, for the lecture, Dr. Alvaro Pelais, uh, he's uh, the project's director, hired the service of simultaneous translation. Uh, the primary benefit of hiring this service is that um, it creates a more inclusive environment. So we have um, non-Spanish and English, non-Spanish speakers and Spanish speakers. But I think, I, I was thinking about this, but more importantly, um, the audience will understand the lecture. So that's, that's <laughs> the primary benefit. Uh, the primary limit is that the lecture is just a small part of the activities involved in hosting a non-Spanish speaker philosopher. So besides the lecture, we have, um, we have a following discussion, we have advice sessions. Uh, so there are a lot of activities uh, that, that, um, that we have to take into account when we think about hosting a non-Spanish uh, philosopher. Um, and all of them, uh, in, in all those um, additional activities, we don't have the service of of simultaneous translation. And um, so differences between attending a lecture in Spanish and a lecture in English are reflected on their reactions to it. So, um, so for instance, in, in Christopher's lecture, um, in, in, in that case, we thought, for instance, we, we might think something like, we, we're not going to follow the response uh, to the query, so it might be that we don't even pose one, we don't even pose a question. Um, mm -hmm. It is worth mentioning that some of our non-Spanish visitors have given their lectures in Spanish. So for instance, uh, Professor Susana Siegel, uh, she um, had given three lectures in Spanish at one C. Uh, also, um, uh, PhD student Thomas Maya, uh, he, his mother tongue is German, and and he um, gave his lecture in Spanish. So, um, do, do we do philosophy in English at one C? And, and no, we don't. Uh, almost none of the members of the project normally engage in philosophical discussions, give talks or write papers in English. Um, papers talk at one C, uh, philosophy, I'm sorry, philosophy, uh, taught at one C uh, is in Spanish. So uh, against what Rodriguez Pereira holds, um, students at one C do not read philosophy in, in English. Um, in in at one C, uh, we don't have a program in philosophy, an undergraduate or a graduate program in philosophy. <coughs> we have a program in humanities. And this program, um, only philosophy in this program covers only 30% um, of, of, the, of the classes. Um, so this, this might be a reason why uh, we don't, I mean, we don't, we don't, um, it, is, it is a very small percentage uh, uh, <coughs> of, of philosophy that it is included in, in the humanities program. And also, the classes are introductory. Uh, the philosophy classes are introductory. So what we do is we use classic references that are already translated into Spanish. 
Um, so, uh, following my case, after the lecture, Christopher gave a two-hour research advice uh, to four students. All of them were external, are external to WAMC. Um, and um, <coughs> as I said earlier, there were not professional translators for uh, the advice sessions to happen. Um, so two students, two of them, needed a translator for the advice session. Uh, it is, this is worth mentioning. They read philosophy in English all the time, but they cannot speak or understand uh, spoken English. Mm -hmm. uh, I helped with the, with the translation and committed mistakes. So for instance, instead of saying, and this is not a, a, a small mistake, <laughs> instead of saying X explain Y, I said Y explains X. <laughs> um, Christopher, he reads and understands the Spanish, and he corrects the mistake. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, fortunately. <laughs> um, <coughs> additionally, I left out details of Christopher's feedback to the students, uh, because my vocabulary in English is, is not that rich and broad. And um, now, now uh, well, this, is, this happened uh, after the lecture, so I, I think it is, it is important to, to, um, to see that, indeed, the lecture um, was held um, in, we used the service of simultaneous translation, but the discussion and the advice sessions, uh, we didn't uh, have this service. So the, the experience was very different. And um, now, <coughs> now I turn to Spanish. Um, podríamos, podríamos plantear algunas preguntas. Eh, por ejemplo, satisfacemos las condiciones materiales para eh, tener a un filósofo no hablante del español. Y pensé que si nos limitamos a, a la conferencia diría que sí, pero como les decía, eh, cuando, cuando se hospeda a un, eh, cuando se invita y, y se recibe a un filósofo no hablante del español, Eh, hay, hay muchas otras actividades que están alrededor de la conferencia eh, y entonces eh, pareciera que hay ciertas condiciones materiales que no satisfacemos. Eh, ¿Deberíamos entonces tener solo hablantes del español para, para dar eh, conferencias en la UAMC? Eh, yo, yo creo que, que no podemos pedir el requisito a... a al profesorado y a los estudiantes de hablar inglés para poder asistir a una conferencia eh, sobre filosofía. A ver, aunque sí podríamos eh, recomendar a los estudiantes o recomendar al profesorado aprender inglés, no podemos ponerlo como una condición para, para asistir a las conferencias. Sin embargo, creo que sí podemos crear un mejor entorno para comunicarnos en español y en inglés. Eh, por ejemplo, y esto ya lo habíamos mencionado, hice, hice los comentarios, la primera versión eh, la hice en inglés y después hice la traducción eh, y, y claro, volvía de una versión a otra y me di cuenta que puedo, a ver, que puedo mejorar la formulación, justo lo, lo que decíamos este, a, hace rato, este, puedo form, formular mejor, más claramente mis ideas este, en español. Eh, La, la tercera cuestión es eh, si deberíamos dejar de usar la traducción simultánea. Y, eh, y como, como, como recién mencionaba, en la UAMC no tenemos los mecanismos eh, para imponer eh, ni a los miembros eh, de, del profesorado ni a los estudiantes eh, el requisito de inglés para, para asistir a las conferencias. Entonces, Pareciera que, que si invitamos a un, a un no hablante del español, la traducción simultánea es una condición. Eh, es, es estimulante visitar la UAMC si casi ninguno de nosotros es competente de, del inglés, por ejemplo, en el caso de Christopher. Eh, pienso que para no perder la oportunidad de interactuar eh, personal y filosóficamente con... con, con con los huéspedes, eh, con, con, est, con los filósofos que nos visitan, creo que alguno de los, algunos de los miembros del proyecto pueden funcionar como traductores, a ver, no profesionales, pero, pero que pueden jugar ese papel. Eh, la, la cuarta cuestión es si, eh, no, la última, la última, perdón, 
Eh, sí, la traducción simultánea <coughs> ha sido un medio efectivo para, para tener a invitados no hablantes del español. Y pienso que sí lo ha sido. Eh, ver, por supuesto que, que el idioma es nuestro vehículo para comunicar y dis discutir ideas. Eh, pero creo que, que a ver, las dificultades que, podemos, eh, que se pueden presentar en el proyecto no tienen que ver eh, principalmente con el idioma, sino con nuestras actitudes para comunicar y discutir ideas. Este, y ese, ese es el, a ver, esa es como mi, mi mayor preocupación. Eh, to, to, ah, sí, las, las conclusiones es que eh, a ver, los objetivos del proyecto son, entre otros, comunicar y discutir ideas en un entorno filosófico. Eh, comunicarse y discutir en dos idiomas tiene muchas ventajas. Eh, como les decía, uno, uno puede mejorar la formulación eh, de, de sus ideas, puede aclarar este, sus propias ideas. Eh, y, y de nuevo creo que, que nuestro, la comunidad filosófica en la UAM puede mejorar eh, si nuestras actitudes eh, como, como filósofos eh, cambian, a ver, nos atrevemos a, a plantear preguntas, nos atrevemos a pedir aclaraciones, eh, y entonces creo, creo que más bien deberíamos de enfocarnos en esa parte, no tanto en el idioma, este, y eso es todo, muchas gracias. Sí, seguro. Bueno, yo también quiero comenzar eh, eh, con agra agradeciéndole a Susana y al observatorio y a todos ustedes por estar aquí. Eh, I want to begin by say, saying thank you very much to Susana for inviting us, for having us all here, and to the observatory and to all of you. Um, and I think I'm going to be brief, creo que voy a ser breve. Eh, cuando yo estaba en, en, en la UNAM, en México, escribiendo mi tesis, eh, empezó esta discusión de si sería una ventaja que la UNAM nos permitiera eh, escribir tesis en inglés. So when I was uh, back in Mexico writing my master's thesis, there, there was this discussion as to whether it would be an advantage for students to be able to uh, submit their thesis in English. Y la, las razones que se daban a favor de hacer esto era, bueno, será más fácil de ahí desprender un, un, un ensayo con el que uno pueda mandar solicitudes al extranjero, nos llevará menos tiempo. Uh, eh, uno puede desarrollar su competencia en otro idioma, supuestamente ya debería uno de manejar muy bien el español, eh, y razones eh, eh, de ese estilo. So some of the reasons given in favor of this uh, were like this, were like, look, it would be easier for students to have their materials ready when they try to apply to uh, PhD programs, for instance, in the US or in the UK or in the UK. Uh, also, they could master some other uh, language. Uh, um, perhaps they're already competent enough in Spanish. Um, y bueno, uh, al final eh, no, no permitieron que esto sucediera. Este, afortunadamente, yo creo, at the end, this was not uh, something that actually happened. Y yo creo que esto es por buenas razones. And I think this is for good reasons. Eh, yo creo que es una ventaja eh, eh, tener que traducir, si quiere uno solicitar a otro país, bueno, tener que traducir los materiales de su, de su maestría o de su doctorado, de su licenciatura al idioma donde quiere solicitar. Y esto es este, en el espíritu de lo que se ha dicho en las pláticas anteriores, entonces yo coincido con eso. Eh, so I think this, is for, this was great that, that this, this proposal never came through and that if you want to do a master's in UNAM, you have to write a dissertation, you have to, you have to write a thesis in Spanish. And I think uh, uh, being able to translate into another language uh, is advantageous, uh, as, uh, and this is very much in the spirit of previous uh, uh, commentaries. Eh, sin embargo, yo creo que sí hay otras desventajas que una persona que habla, que su idioma nativo es el español, eh, sí hay desventajas a las que esta persona se enfrenta al eh, tratar de acoplarse a una comunidad 
que es predominantemente de habla inglesa. However, I do think there are other disadvantages. This I didn't think was a disadvantage, but I think there are other disadvantages that uh, uh, someone that is has uh, the Spanish, for instance, as uh, a native uh, language faces when trying to um, to fit into a predominantly English speaking community. Y entre estas desventajas está en cosas de las que ya hablamos, por ejemplo, estos implicit bias, el hecho de que eh, no es que uno no quiera tener un acento, sino es la manera en la que va a ser tomada una aseveración que uno hace cuando tiene un acento de una comunidad, este, eh, un acento eh, latino, por ejemplo. Y aquí sería muy bueno tener estudios que, que pudieran este, respaldar o no estas este, opiniones, meramente opiniones, eh, pero ese es, esa es una de las desventajas que yo creo que este, un hispanohablante enfrenta al tratar de acoplarse a una comunidad eh, eh, dominada por el idioma inglés. So here I think that implicit biases is uh, one example of some of the disadvantages that a native Spanish speaker uh, may face uh, when trying to fit into an English speaking community. And here I want to note that it would be good to have data on this. Uh, these are just opinions that uh, I've heard and I've seen and we would need to um, uh, back them up with research, but if this were the case, this would be like a, an actual disadvantage. Entre otras desventajas está el tiempo en la traducción, lo que uno tarda en eh, estar en un seminario o en una conversación más o menos rápida y entonces uno quiere hacer una objeción, pero entonces en lo que la traduces y la pones en la manera más correcta, a lo mejor el tiempo pasó y ya no tuviste oportunidad de hacer tu intervención de la manera más eficaz. Eh, so another disadvantage might just be the time it takes you to translate what you're trying to say into the actual uh, best way uh, to say it in a way in which it would impact the conversation or would be taken seriously. Uh, uh, y, y bueno, todos estos factores, eh, eh, sobre todo impactan en, en, en se van acumulando, este, la filosofía eh, es bien sabido, es una disciplina que eh, 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 es agresiva, es difícil como encontrar la manera de interactuar algunas veces, este, esto, esto en, en, eh, ha sido visto en, en cuestiones, por ejemplo, de eh, por qué hay tan pocas mujeres en la profesión y yo creo que estas cosas se conectan y se van, se van este, sumando las dificultades que una persona puede enfrentar eh, eh, al tratar de incorporarse a la filosofía. So these things sum up with other kinds of implicit bias in the profession and this can make uh, trying to fit into the community a little bit um, um, harder and I do think that these are things that are, it's important to be uh, taken seriously. Uh, on the other hand, I, I also think that um, uh, with PEP, I think we should not victimize. This is the, the solution to this is not to victimize, to say how hard it is, you know. Uh, 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 that's not the kind of discourse that is going to take us uh, 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 anywhere, right? No creo que victimizarnos sea la solución, no creo que ponernos en la posición de este, qué difícil es este, eh, estar en una posición de minoría sea la manera de lidiar con estos problemas. Pero entonces la pregunta, y yo creo que este es el reto que todos enfrentamos aquí, es, bueno, ¿qué hacer? ¿Qué podemos hacer para no estar en una posición de victimización, pero al mismo tiempo responsablemente enfrentar que es posible que este... Eh, haya una desventaja, una desventaja en una minoría que, por ejemplo, en Estados Unidos está creciendo y la pregunta es qué hacer. So, yeah, uh, victimization is not the way and so the challenge I think we face is what to do about this, what positive things we can do without trying to uh, take the position of the victim to face these problems and try to help uh, uh, the Latin America community, say, for instance, in the U.S. or... Uh, um, um, yeah, and, and other types of minorities. And so, um, very vaguely, I was just thinking, I, I had just two thoughts that I just want to throw in and spark some uh, discussion. They're very general, so I want to really hear from you. But one thing I, 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 I think, uh, as I said earlier, I think would be valuable is just to foster philosophy itself in Spanish-speaking countries. Why? Because I think uh, this would produce uh, more philosophy, better philosophy, just uh, allowing philosophy to impact more people will just make it reach out, would just make people that uh, might be interested in philosophy um, uh, enter in and just the sheer numbers will, will help there. Um, 
Uh, ¿Y qué hacer aquí? Una propuesta es simplemente fomentar la filosofía en países de eh, lengua eh, española, en Latinoamérica, por ejemplo. ¿Por qué? Porque simplemente tener más alcance va a lograr que este, más estudiantes eh, se interesen en la filosofía o se puedan <coughs> interesar en la filosofía, que más adelante pueden eh, ser voces importantes en la discusión. Um, uh, and this might sound obvious, but I just want to point out that in countries like Mexico, the number of uh, uh, the quota, the number the, of, of classes, of philosophy classes in elementary, secondary, and now I hear also in undergraduate levels are diminishing. Right? It's like there's this tendency to diminish the amount of philosophy in our uh, curricula, <coughs> and uh, here's here's a point in which I think we as philosophers might be able to like do something, put some pressure, and try to counterbalance this tendency. Aquí quisiera solo este, mencionar que la tendencia, por lo menos en México, como yo lo entiendo, es a disminuir el número de requisitos de filosofía y critical thinking y pensamiento crítico a niveles elementales, de secundaria y, este, como decía Laura, este, de licenciatura también, en donde puede haber solo una licenciatura en humanidades y no una en filosofía propiamente. Y, y bueno, creo que esto eh, no solo ayuda a producir mejor filosofía, sino a tener eh, estudiantes que son más críticos, que pueden encontrar más fuerza en sus opiniones, que pueden eh, eh, valorar la eh, honestidad intelectual y sentirse más seguros cuando saben, bueno, es que mi razonamiento este, es, es, está bien y me voy a parar y voy a expresar mi opinión. O sea, creo que le puede dar herramientas a los estudiantes para ser más este, críticos y tener más confianza en las opiniones que, que expresan. Um, so, in general, I think this uh, critical uh, thinking skills could just help students be more confident in their opinions, in the way they express them. And uh, so, so the point is, it's not just that it, it might produce better philosophers, but it's good in and of itself. It's a thing that is, in principle, um, good to do. Um, and the second uh, suggestion, or just a amorphous thought I had is, uh, and this response to the practical considerations that Pepa and other people as well were voicing of, uh, look, um, uh, publishing in English or writing in English, uh, it's advantageous because there's a lot of pressure to uh, publish in well-known uh, journals and just asking students in Spanish-speaking countries to not do this might uh, deprive them of some opportunities that they, they might, uh, might, uh, that, that might have allowed them to like, have a better career, right? So, in this asunto está la cuestión pragmática de Hay mucha presión, el mercado laboral no es muy favorable ahora y es cierto que pedirle a los estudiantes que publiquen en español y entonces no tengan alcance a este, journals que están mejor posicionados y que les pueden ayudar a tener un mejor desarrollo en su carrera puede, puede ir en detrimento de las carreras de estos estudiantes. ¿no? Y entonces esta puede ser una consideración a favor de... Este, eh, eh, escribir más en inglés, hablar más en inglés y... Eh, eh, apoyar la idea de que el inglés sea el idioma en el que se discuta la filosofía. Y, uh, and so here my, my proposal is just that there may be, we, we could divide the efforts, right? So maybe a student that's starting her career and that is just trying to learn philosophy and try to figure out how to express her thoughts better, how to deal with the different values in how to communicate a thought. I mean, uh, English speakers tend to be more assertive, more confident to put their thesis in this, uh, in, in my experience at least, in this more, uh, uh, in a stronger way. Trying to learn all this takes time and I just think that maybe early on in the career it would be good to allow students to just uh, do whatever they can do to fit in, to try to establish themselves, to do, uh, to, to find a spot in their career. But then people that are already established, people later on in their careers could just, uh, uh, be the ones who are trying to uh, promote writing in Spanish, trying to uh, be these role models that try to uh, 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 bring other students that probably don't speak English into the discussion, uh, foster communities that are uh, uh, promoting exchanges between English speakers and non-English speakers. 
Eh, y aquí la idea simplemente es que a lo mejor podemos dividir las fuerzas, ¿no? Y decir, eh, las personas que están comenzando su carrera, bueno, a lo mejor a ellos sí eh, les conviene no tratar de publicar en español al principio, sino tratar de mandar sus artículos a este, journals más eh, ya reconocidos para ayudarlos a desarrollar su carrera, pero una vez que eh, 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 el filósofo o la filósofa han estado establecidos, se han establecido, entonces eh, en ellos sí que tienen un poco menos de presión de, eh, no sé, eh, conseguir un trabajo eh, o tener tenure, entonces sí tratar de eh, eh, estar en asociaciones que... Eh, fomenten lazos entre la comunidad hispanohablante y la comunidad eh, de habla inglesa y que traten de eh, alcanzar o tener como un mayor alcance de las discusiones a personas que probablemente no, este, no, no serían alcanzadas de, de otra manera. Eh, y bueno, eh, so, so the idea, uh, I've already said that in English, but so I don't have to translate. Okay. <laughs> I think. Eh, so, eh, eh, esos son, son este... Son las ideas que yo tengo, obviamente eh, hay ya muchos esfuerzos que se están haciendo en estas direcciones, pero yo creo que estar conscientes, ponerlos en la mesa y ver de qué maneras podemos eh, sumarnos, es, este, es, es, es lo que pienso yo, eh, son las, las cosas que pienso yo podrían eh, movernos a, hacia adelante. So these are general thoughts, they're, they're efforts that are already being made by uh, uh, many people in this room, uh, just by this conference, by uh, associations in Latin America, by exchanges, but this is what I think, I mean, but we should just add on those, right? And it should be, uh, I think, uh, it should be clear that this are, uh, it, sh it should be clear which are the good ways to add uh, on these efforts if one is interested in, in adding on. And I mean, this is, this is basically my, my, my two proposals and I re I'm really interested in hearing uh, from you. Thank you very much. Sorry if I have, if I'm going to maybe ask the questions that I, you guys already answered in the previous panel. I couldn't be here, uh, but thank you for the presentations. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, um, your, you, uh, your name again was Carla. Carla. Um, you say to talk about to do philosophy, to foster philosophy. Nonetheless, there is plenty of philosophy going on in Latin America, at least. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Mexico, but it's not analytical. I mean, that's a big elephant in the room is the fact that it's not analytical. You know, it is continental or whatever you want to call it. Um, and the whole culture is wired in a way in which uh, you are asked to respond in certain ways. Um, the whole culture is wired in terms of like, you know, you're doing, providing, producing essays, the Latin American thought or Spanish thought is, uh, not, you don't, we don't produce philosophers, we produce pensadores, quote unquote, mm -hmm. and we produce essays and not uh, scholars, schol papers, you know, <laughs> which, <laughs> is, which is a very particular aspect of the identity of, and also, I mean, the, you have, you're wiring away, we're wiring away in a lot, across the whole region in terms of um, being a la France, you know, I mean, you have a philosopher who is the, uh, public intellectual who is going to be asked questions, but well, it doesn't happen in the, in, in the islands, I mean, in, in, in England and in this country either. So my question was, I mean, I mean, we need that, to go against that is to go against the, quote unquote, the culture <laughs> of, of the region. I mean, uh, to try to broaden the philosophical, um, it's important to broaden the philosophical spectrum, of course, mm -hmm. but what about that? other aspect of it. I mean, I think that one of the things that is going on, for example, it's not that hard for people trained in the United States in political theory or in, or in um, even, even in moral or ethical philosophy. <coughs> I, mean, uh, philosoph I mean, to go back to Latin America and do work mm -hmm. because that is basically a sine qua non of the, of, the, uh, of the space, of the debate of the space of debate. But mostly when you're talking about analytical um, philosophy, you're always talking about, I mean, those very highly specific aspects of analytical philosophy that are not touched by continental philosophy. Mm -hmm. I work in aesthetics and I can travel back and forth from one 
region to the other because there is, but here is minimal what you do in aesthetics, in analytical philosophy, minimal. Well, you cross to France and then you have plenty of it, mm -hmm. or in Argentina or in everywhere else. So that, my question was how to broaden that, considering though that, uh, you can answer. No, no, I was no, can answer me, you can answer me. I'm teasing. <laughs> But that, that was, my, that was my, my, my question. And I mean, I think that that's basically underlining the whole conversation, but uh, it had to do with not really, I mean, it has to do with philosophy, it has to do with the culture, the way it's wired, and the, and the kind of networks that are working around. So let me see if I'm understanding. So you're thinking that by fostering analytic philosophy, that will go against continental philosophy? No, I'm not it? saying that it's going against it, but you know, but there are two distinct different types right. of schools. You know, right. I mean, one is historically based. <laughs> I mean, when I, when I entered into school in Peru, I had to study Marxism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as 101, 102, 103, 104. <laughs> right. I mean, that was it. Yeah. And then if I passed that, I would study phenomenology, mm -hmm. you know, right. which is funny, but that's the way it was. Yeah. Um, I came to this country I transfer uh, and I changed the whole gears. I mean, of of my of my thinking, uh -huh. but it was. I mean, but those. It seems to me that it was an unsolvable gulf. It was a gulf that was very very complicated mm -hmm. to solve. It seems that in certain aspects where they overlap, mm -hmm. it's fine, but in certain others there is. I mean, what to do to either produce a very good magazine, to produce a very good network, a very good journal, that you'll be able to really have, um, be able to be recognized in this country. And then the other question obviously is, why should it? You know, why should be, this be the, the, the criteria? No? I would just think that it should be up to the student, right? Yeah. I mean, the two ways of doing philosophy should be available and it should be up mm -hmm. for the student. So it shouldn't be that uh, there's no way of uh, channeling the student into analytic philosophy because there's a dominance of continental philosophy or the other way around. So I just think that in fostering philosophy, we want to foster also different ways of doing philosophy and then it's up to the student to, um, to choose. But I mean, other than that, I, 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 I wouldn't know how to go against the history of how philosophy has been done or whether that should happen. Maybe we should just take advantage of the fact that there's this oldest continental philosophy to just also promote, I mean, promote philosophy in general and promote other types of doing philosophy. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say, I don't know what to say. Um, no, I, I, I have a question for, for so in, in, in your conclusion, you say, um, you, you paraphrase, or that is universally regarded by ex experts as a completely faithful translation of the original. And I was wondering, um, so you're asking, I, I'm sure that you're not asking for the perfect translation because what would be, what would be no, having no, no, such, a, no. such a case? Not perfect, but uh, the one that is semantically equivalent in those two senses that I mentioned. That's, that's what is behind that, or behind the whole paper. But is it, is it that the aim, um, is, is it that, you, that you're aiming for everyone to agree with, with the translation? I mean, that, that would be, you just want to, to communicate an idea, and, and you don't want everyone to agree with you, isn't it? Or well, you, you want to agree that they are actually <clears throat> understanding the text. A translation mm -hmm. is an interpretation, okay? Mm -hmm. Translation is an interpretation. And there are different types of interpretations. For example, there is the authorial one. You want to understand, you want in your head the acts of understanding which are similar to the acts of understanding the author had. There is an audiential interpretation, namely, I want to understand how, for example, uh, <clears throat> Kant's critique of pure reason, or a sentence in Kant's critique of pure reason, that makes more sense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it was understood by uh, a German, inter German intellectuals in his <coughs> period, for example, mm -hmm. or how they are understood by post-Kantians <laughs> today, or, you know, an, an audience. 
And then you have you you can also have a different type of interpretation, which aims to have to to understand the meaning of the text, in regardless of what the author thought or you know a particular audience thinks. I don't know how that can be understood, but the, 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 there are people who believe that it's the text what counts. And then there is another one, which is the relational interpretation. In other words, that you take uh, the text or its meaning, and then you relate it to something that you bring into it. And what you're interested in understanding is the relationship between the two. For example, if you give a Freudian interpretation of <laughs> Kant's critique of your reason, now what that would be, I don't know what it would be, but uh, that that kind of thing, you know, in other things. So uh, the the question is, what do you a translation is usually meant to be something like, I cannot speak for every translator, but people tend to, translators usually are trying to figure out what the author wanted to say mm -hmm. or said. Okay. And therefore, there are different ways of doing that. I just, uh, you know, you, you have, how many translations of, of uh, Aristotle's metaphysics are there? or of Plato's dialogues. And each of them thinks that they have translated the text for an English audience to cause in that audience acts of understanding, which were the acts of understanding that perhaps the original author mm -hmm. had intended for the, his or her audience, in this case his audience, had. And if you succeed in doing that, you have the, under, the number two there in my in my handout. Um, but if you don't succeed, well, then you have a problem. Now, there's also the issue that you don't have it. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. Yeah, but you can But you can have a, a situation. You, you have to consider the fact that audiences change. So mm -hmm. a translation is always for an audience. Someone said that here, and it's so true. Uh, so you are translating for 20th century uh, American, oh yes, thank you, <laughs> 21st century uh, Americans of a certain persuasion, namely faculty members or philosophers or ordinary people or this or that. And so your translation is geared to that. You know, your translation may fail in not doing what it's intended to do, mm -hmm. or it may actually be successful. Uh, and so that, that's the case. The case of the Bible, for example. I mean, how many translations are there in the Bible? There's the King James, and there's this, and there's that. Okay, Every generation needs one. You want to follow up? Or? No, it's okay. Okay, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Gracias, Susana. Gracias, Susana. I didn't say that. <laughs> 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 so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to bluntly question the truth of the, your, at least your first strategy, since I don't have time. It seems to me that you said that for Rear Pereira's thesis to work, uh, there should be this community of analytic philosophers, and there isn't. Ah, by the everyone's argument's lights, there is such a thing. Otherwise, some of the arguments wouldn't go. There, there. I mean, look, listen, um, you, <laughs> the training, the same curricula, methodological, um, methodological presuppositions. Um, presuppositions, okay. The same kind of language, the same kind of um, style of writing, the same philosophical tradition, the same readings, I would say. Look at all the philosophy departments in the States. I mean, many of, most of the arguments, or most of the arguments that are being put forward here, I said, just to, to get things off the ground, we wouldn't even get off the ground if there wasn't anything like what you say that next says which is this kind of community of analytic philosophy. But you see, that I don't think that there is... I, I think that I... Before you answer, we have to leave the room in a few minutes, so... <laughs> okay. Yeah. My point is that, is that if you really talk to analytic philosophers, there are many varieties. There are many varieties. There are people who are still doing ordinary language philosophy. That, that is really something very different than what, you know... Uh, a sort of quasi, uh, well, someone from the Vienna Circle was doing or trying to do. 
And what they aimed to do was entirely different from ordinary language. I remember when I was, you know, early on in my career, I wrote, I wrote an, a, paper, a paper on wanting and having, having. And, you know, it was all about what white used to do. In other words, take sentences of ordinary language English and say, oh, white works, this, I mean, wanting works this way and having works this way. Now I read that and I say, I was doing something entirely different from what, I, what I'm doing now or what I thought I was doing. So there are many types. No, there is some community. There is some community. But the point is that if you compare it with the Middle Ages, there is much less community in the community today than there was at that time. And in the Middle Ages, uh, the result was that they were sort of pretty much trapped in the parameters of the discussion, and they couldn't get out. OK, what did Carla? Oh, sorry. <laughs> we have to get out. <laughs> I mean, Patricia. <laughs> I have a question for uh, Carla. Oh, sure. I thought, um, so I uh, agree with basically everything you said. And uh, oh, I also, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I also think that uh, we shouldn't victimize ourselves, but we shouldn't forget that there are these difficulties to insert ourselves in Spanish-speaking communities. So we have to talk about that, because it is a problem. Um, so what I wanted to ask you is about your second recommendation. Mm -hmm. So you said that maybe what we can do is to uh, advise uh, young uh, intellectuals who are just uh, forming uh, in the, the formation stage to publish and write in English, and uh, then to develop and establish intellectuals to maybe open or foster uh, philosophy in Spanish. So I was wondering whether you had that in mind for people, Spanish-speaking people working here uh, in the States, or uh, you think that that would also work in Latin America. So I don't know if your recommendation was general or right. only for people like you and me yeah, yeah. who are here. Uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. No. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, I was. I was more. More than advice. I was just thinking. It depends on the purposes of each person, right? If someone in Mexico wants to move to the states, then probably it's a good idea for them to try to publish in some journals in in, in English. I, I wouldn't. I wasn't thinking of advising anyone, but just like doing whatever. When I, I just was just thinking that it's easier to help when you're in a better, stronger position. And so while you get there, it would be good to do whatever you think practically would help you get get there. And um, so, so yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say advice, but I would just say the burden should be in, in you once you're in a stronger position. Perhaps that makes sense. I was thinking of what Sophia was saying too in terms of the two children, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, at some point you're handling too many things. Maybe I should wrap up too. Uh, you're, you're handling too many things, right? You can't like publish in Spanish, but get a job. And like, I was just thinking maybe later on, once you have a job, you can be like, okay, instead of sending this paper to uh, this uh, journal in English, I'm gonna send it to this other paper, uh, sorry, other journal that is, uh, um, I don't know, that's Spanish-speaking journal, but I, yeah, I wasn't trying yeah, to generalize. No, no, that yeah. sounds great. Yeah. It's a great suggestion. But um, again, I, what I wanted to know is whether you think that that is for the Spanish speakers who are in the States and right. become professors at American institutions. Yeah, I think. Um, you know, uh, there are some examples, uh, or you are thinking of uh, Latin Americans working in Latin American institutions. Uh, uh, so I was more thinking of people that are trying to establish themselves, say, in the in state. here in the US, okay, in the yeah. States. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're probably not waiting to go home. So yeah, so I should <laughs> go home. So thanks you guys so much. All right. I have a question for you.